All right, guys, welcome to the podcast. This is the first ever uh, episode of the Improving Always podcast. Uh, I'm here with uh, SK Training, uh, Dimitri, uh, and Noblet uh, Strength Systems. Um, and yeah, the first episode, we're going to talk about individual tra- technical training. Uh, I think it's a, t- it's a topic that a lot of uh, you know footballers, soccer players are really interested in because uh, as all of us say all the time uh, on our you know social media uh, and with players that we work with, um, what you're doing with your team probably isn't enough unless you're playing at an incredibly high level. You need to be doing a lot of work um, by yourself as well. That's what's going to really uh, you know, make the difference. So yeah, let's hop right in and talk about uh, the individual technical training that you should be doing if you want to uh, go pro or you know just play at the highest level that you can possibly play at. Um, so I'll uh, I'll start off really quick just by saying that um, obviously, yeah, as I've just said, the the theme of the podcast is individual technical training. But if you can. Um, you should prioritize finding a good training partner uh, or a group that you can train with. Team training should always come first. Even things like playing pickup games uh, should probably come first. I think most players will get a lot more out of that than they would about uh, you know training on their own. Obviously, there's a time and a place to just train on your own. But if you can, training with other players is you know just uh, the the most important thing. It's going to help you improve more than anything else. All right, so I can go first. I don't mind. One thing, one real quick thing, I think even like like you said, having two or three of your friends and just training like that is a lot more beneficial than individual training. So I totally agree with that. So for me, individual training, two things that I focus on. One of them is what part of season you're in, if you are in a team. And the second part is what position you play. So for example, if you're in the off-season This is how I usually set up my training sessions. I would go 10 minutes of warm up and then 25 minutes of technical work, just dribbling, passing for such like that. And then you get into like 30 minutes of position specific drills while still focusing on the technical aspect of it. And then 10, 15 minutes of agility. And then you end it off with, if you want, this is optional, 10 minutes of doing whatever you want, whether if it's like one of your weaknesses or you just want to improve something, you just work on that for 10 minutes. And then you end it off with a small cool down, however long you like. So that's for off season. So for preseason, I would put a little less technical work because I would expect your team to provide that since you are in a preseason, a little less technical work. And I would put in a little more fitness, a lot more fitness work with the ball on and off. Just uh, what do you call it? Like a hit kind of style of fitness with the ball. Mm-hmm. And then I would do some position specific still and a little bit of agility at the end of it or before, however you want to put, uh, set that up. And I would end it off with a cool down. And for me in season is where I do the least of my individual training just to stay ready for games and whatever in season for me, it's very simple. I usually just do a warm up like usual. And then I do like 10, 15 minutes of, or 20 minutes of, position specific work with the ball and then for the last 20 minutes or 30 minutes I would work on things that I've seen during the game that I need to work on for example I'm a fullback like if my throw-ins aren't good I would spend the last 30 minutes of my training session just doing throw-ins and working on that so Mm -hmm. that's how I would set up my individual training sessions Yeah. So, um, I, uh, I did write down that I want to go through, you know, there's obviously there's going to be a lot of similarities position to position, but I do want to go through, you know, um, kind of things that you should think about in your individual training, depending on position. Um, and I'll also say that, you know, you're at an age now where probably, you know, improvement is still important, but, uh, performance becomes a lot more important once you get to 18, 19, 20, because, you know, you're trying to take the next step. As a youth player, um, I don't think your individual training will vary so much in season, out of season, um, preseason, except obviously if you have restrictions on your time and obviously you still want to be ready for games. Uh, but you know, when you're an elite, uh, you know, when you're playing at a high level in season, the priority is play well in games. Obviously you can improve along the way. 
Uh, but at, at a certain point, you know, that does take a, take a secondary focus, you know, uh, to use an extreme example, you know, like Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo there, yes, they can still improve, but the most important thing for them is playing well and performing in games, um, and, you know, being, being prepared for that. And, you know, you contrast that to like a, a 10 year old, uh, who's playing in games that they won't remember in five years or, you know, even in a year, um, the games don't matter. It's all about improvement. As you start to work your way up, you play in high school, you play in college, you play semi-pro, you play professional, you know, your priorities start to shift, um, away from improvement and more towards, uh, performance. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I feel like most of the time in season, I'm not going to be doing way too much individual stuff. That's like, not just purely technical work. I probably like, unless I'm very out of shape or like I'm very slow, my accelerations aren't doing, doing what they should be. It's all technical for me. Um, when it comes to the sessions, it's just going to be like 30 minutes, an hour um, of me going to the field with a ball. I'll probably have something like in my mind, like a theme of what I want to do, like work on the first touch, work on like, long distance passing or something, which is a little bit harder when it's just you. Um, But that's what I'm going to be focusing on. And then as the session goes on, whatever I feel like that kind of like fits with this theme, I'm just going to do it, you know, because you go in, um, it's you're in season, you go, you do preseason, you're probably not doing any individual sessions during preseason if you're at a high level. Um, Because most of these teams, even if you're like, in Spain, fourth division, third division, not even to mention like second and first. Um, it's two, two, two hour sessions a day and you're destroyed, you know? So you get your fitness base in there and then all your individual training sessions, it's just technique. And, I mean, yeah. even, even the high, even high school teams in the, in the States do, you know, double days where like, you know, if you're training for, uh, if you're doing two sessions a day with your team, you probably shouldn't do anything else that day. That's strenuous. Uh, not to say you can't get to the field 15 minutes early and do a technical warm up by yourself, um, depending depending what level you're playing at, you know. Um, uh, but obviously, you know everything you do um, for almost every player in the world, it should supplement your team training, not kind of take away from it. Yeah, I um, agree. I agree with pretty much everything in this so far, and. I just wanted to add because I have a lot of experience training individually because I grew up in a rural town. I can't, I can't, I can't tell, man. And (laughs) there were, you go to the soccer field, it's empty, except for maybe someone throwing an American football. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so it'd be me by out, out by myself. And this is why I think one of the main points that we really need to focus on with individual training is it has to be fun. Because what got me out there every single day, knowing that I was probably going to be out by myself for an hour or more, and it was that I enjoyed doing it and that I felt that it was worth my time to be out there. So like, for example, I mean, it's not that you shouldn't do fitness, but if I was out there doing fitness, do you think I would have gone out seven days a week as a kid? (laughs) Hell no. (laughs) I would have skipped that and done anything else. But for me... Um, especially as a kid, my trainings were always very improvised, but a lot of technical skills. Um, that's actually really why I got into the juggling stuff and all that stuff is because like, how do you press, like push yourself when you're by yourself? There's no teammates, no defenders, no nothing. Do that. Practice doing moves to shoot to finish mm-hmm. and different things like that. I mean, if you can find a teammate to play with and train with that's the best thing when i was playing professional indoor my roommate and i would stay after training for two three hours because that's what we did and also the goalkeeper on the team so we would practice multiple different passing and finishing things with the goalkeeper and because the goalkeeper's there we have to do finishing which was perfect for us (laughs) Yeah, no, what I a have, problem. You have to do finishing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, having having a goalkeeper is uh, is awesome. I always love when I when I have goalkeepers for like small group uh small group sessions. That's why I used to make Dimitri be uh play in net and just rip shots yeah. at him until I broke his finger for you know hours yeah. at a time. 
true story. I actually did yep. break his finger. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think still not forgiven. Two, yeah, two <laughs> things that are uh, and to, and told you you were fine afterwards, and then the next day your finger was a balloon. Um, but uh, two two things that um, I kind of want to hit off uh, hit on off of what you guys said is um, the first thing you know the enjoyment is a, just a huge thing um, because if you're not making sessions enjoyable, so I do a lot of, you know, individual sessions, one-on-one with players or with small groups. And if the training isn't enjoyable, uh, they're not going to stick with it. If my own training isn't enjoyable, I'm not going to do it as often. Um, and you know, the, the most important thing is consistency. If you can get yourself out on the field, you know, at least a couple times a week, um, then like that matters more usually yes. than what you're actually doing. Even like, even going out on the field, um, you know, every day and doing, you know, 30 minutes of just juggling stuff or just juggling, yeah. you know, and like building on that, that's better than going out once a week and doing like a very, you know, you know, an hour of a perfectly, uh, designed session or like what, what even is perfect? Because, you know, but perfect. Yeah. Especially it just, it with a really complicated matter. sport like soccer. Yeah, exactly. Consistency, consistency on a mediocre program is better than inconsistency on a perfect program. Yeah, yeah. I agree. This Definitely. goes for everything in life. Like yeah, true. Everything <laughs> in life. Like your homework for school or what you're doing with work. Be consistent with what you're doing and do what you can do consistently. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, um, I know we, we, we had a discussion. Life lessons on the <laughs> yeah. soccer, on the soccer podcast. <laughs> yeah, we we're getting deep. Uh, and then the other thing was, you know, you don't need to train for an hour if you don't have an hour. Like, what do you like? Five minutes is infinitely better than zero. If you're doing five minutes, six days a week, that's half an hour. That's not bad. You can build on that, make it 10 minutes. Then you're doing an hour a week. But doing nothing, um, I think, is, is, is it like a Dr. Seuss quote or something? It's like doing no the biggest mistake that people make is doing nothing because they feel that what they can do isn't enough. Like if you can only train for 10 minutes, that's all you can do, but that's fine. You know, if you can wake up uh, 10 minutes earlier and do 10 minutes of juggling every day before school, because that's the only time you have to do individual technical training, um, you should do it. You need to do it if you want to improve. Um, I don't care what situation you're in. If you're not playing at the level that you want to play at, you need to work harder to get to that level. Um, you need to add something in. And if that's adding in five minutes of juggling, then that is what it is. But it's infinitely better than nothing. Agreed. Yeah. And you'll get the, you'll get the, you know, the best returns are like the, the start of what you do. Going from training like five hours a week to training six hours a week, a week, you're like, it's good, but it's not as big as going from training zero hours a week to training one hour a week, right? Like, uh, you'll get the, the biggest gains in that, that first, uh, going from training, not at all to training at least a little bit. That's where you'll get the biggest, uh, the most improvements from. And sometimes when you have time constraints, you can focus more because you know, you have to get something done. Like if I only have 10, 15 minutes to train, I put my mind to it and I get something done, something good, something that I'll think, Hey, I accomplished something. If I have two hours to train, I might spend the first 30 minutes putting on my shoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I definitely take will. a, take a couple extra water breaks. Um, yeah. And like, you know, uh, I don't think, um, like having a fun session, fun sessions for me usually are intense. I'm not saying I won't have the odd session where it's, you know, um, where I'm literally just, uh, doing things for my own enjoyment. So I'm horrible at, uh, freestyling, but I had, we'll have uh, to see I, some video <laughs> for evidence eventually in the future. Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, from both on the I, podcast. <laughs> all, all of us will be going at a time. I'll have to, uh, yeah, I have to, I have to train a little bit more, but you know, it was, uh, if, you know, I, as I get into it, like, you know, I can, I'll do stuff. I'll have sessions where it's a little bit more relaxed, but at the same time, you know, most, most of the time you can, you can bring intensity in your sessions and still enjoy it. I think like, you know, for most people, um, at least, you know, when you're on the field, 
it's not that fun if you're not working hard. Like even like if I go and play pickup, you know, I'm going to win or, oh, I'm gonna, yeah. I, or I'm going to be pissed in the car ride home. Well, I mean, uh, to be <laughs> honest with you, with pickup soccer, I've just gotten over the point to where I, I can actually take it easy on occasion. I'm not going into two-footed sliding tackles to win the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. Either, either I, you I've win been... or someone else goes home with two broken legs. So <laughs> I've, that's the only I've, way it's going to be. I've, I've matured to the point to where I can realize that I played well, and even if we don't win, it's still fun, and we're here for fun. You're you're a couple years older than me. I'll yeah. I'll get there. You're, you're a better you're a better person than the rest of us. When either yeah. I'm going in so relaxed, like oh, it doesn't matter, it's fine, or I'm going full full send. There's no middle ground for me. I can't try hard and then be like, oh wow, I lost. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when uh when I'm playing one v one against my daughter in uh, a year from now, you know when she's six months, uh six months old, um. I guess it'd be like eight months at that point. So she'll be old enough. Um, she's not going to win a game until she mm-hmm. earns it. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, domination. Uh, um, no mercy. No, I, yeah, no mercy. Actually, Dimitri and I were coaching um, at, a, at a camp. And we uh, the last day of the camp, we decided we'd have some fun, play uh, a full field game. Uh, it was like a 99-ish field um against the against the kids with one other coach um and we were going to have the very young kids on our team but almost none of them wanted to play with us because like you guys are going to lose so i looked at d and i was like all right we're not losing this game <laughs> uh just Five, to uh, zero just later to, you know yeah what, what can goals say? later <laughs> But yeah, I mean, like, you know, I think in intensity, intensity is, uh, is definitely important. Um, and you need to balance that intensity with enjoyment. But as I said, I don't think they're, um, you can have a very intense session, uh, probably the, the sessions that I look back on the most fondly are sessions that I worked very hard in, uh, even if it was just by myself or just me and, um, a coach or someone like that. So you don't need to sacrifice intensity um, necessarily to make things uh, enjoyable. Yeah. Or it's, it's the really intense sessions or it's the ones that you go out and you do, even though you're not in the mood to do them at all, you know, yeah, even definitely. when you just do a little something. So if you're not in the mood at all, you go out, you juggle for 10 minutes. Sometimes those are the best so sessions. Yeah. Yeah. It's the sessions that you didn't, you didn't even want to show up to the field that day and getting going is tough, but once you get going, it's like, oh, my touch is good today. I'm starting to feel good. Oh, crap. I just did something I've never done before. That's really yeah. cool. And then you go home feeling wonderful about yourself. And that's, I mean, those are probably the best feelings that you get with training sessions. Is yeah, you didn't and- even want to be there. And then you go home thinking, oh, my gosh, this was actually a great session. This was better than most. Yeah. And like, um, yeah, you're not... Um, if you wake up on game day or you have a team training session and you feel like crap, um, doesn't change the fact that you have to show up and play. Um, you know, you're going to have to, if you play at any high level, uh, any level at all, you're going to have games or important team training sessions or trials or something on a day where you're not feeling great. If every day that you wake up, not feeling great, you're like, ah, I don't need to train today. Um, then, you know, you're never going to be prepared for that. Obviously, if you're, you know, sick and you can't get out of bed, like, you know, it's okay to take a day off. But if, uh, you know, if you just feel not great, then, you know, you can, you can do something, uh, and you're never, you're never going to feel, well, you're probably not going to feel worse after your session, uh, than you did before your session. You're probably going to feel better. Honestly, if you, you know, if you love the sport, it's probably uh, going to, you know, put you in a better, uh, you know, state of mind kind of going out. Even if you're going to do 10 minutes of juggling, um, you'll, you'll probably feel better afterwards. Um, so let's, uh, let's get into a little bit of, I um, want to talk about first kind of how we would um, kind of structure a session. Um and then talk a little bit about like a, a kind of a training schedule, how often you need to be doing this stuff, you know, optimally. Um, and then we'll touch a little bit about on, uh, you know, 
position specific stuff. Um, so the, the thing about structuring a session is I'm a little bit hesitant, um, to, you know, when I'm working with young players, I do structure the session, but for more advanced players. So let's, you know, for my own individual training, um, I, Dimitri touched on it earlier where he said he has, you know, you have some idea what you want to do when you go out to the field, but I don't plan my sessions. Um, I say, you know, I have, uh, 10 minutes that I'm going to warm up, do some juggling. Uh, maybe I'll, you know, add in some tricks. Maybe I'll get out the tennis ball or the size one, um, whatever I'm feeling. Then I'll have another 15 minutes, uh, where I'll do some first touch, maybe wall passing, or maybe, you know, juggling into pop the ball up first touch down two or three touches. Um, but again, I'll decide, you know, based on, uh, kind of how I'm feeling, what I, what I prefer to do, um, because I think that's important. Um, and then I'll get into, you know, maybe I'll focus on passing or do, you know, dribbling stuff. But again, I'll have an idea what I'm going to do when I show up at the field, but I don't structure it. Like I'm going to do, you know, five minutes of juggling then I'm going to do 10 sets of this, 10 sets of this. Uh, I usually just have time slots where I'm like, okay, this is going to be my dynamic warm up. This is going to be my technical warm up. This is going to be, um, you know, this is what I'm going to work on today, but I can do it in a couple different ways. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't usually structure things very rigidly. Uh, and I'm interested to hear your guys, your guys' opinions on, uh, on that as well. So for me, that's totally fine. I do organize my sessions a little more because I, I just found that that works for me. But one thing that I like about how you set it up is that you keep it simple and I could say, like, every day I get some DMs on Instagram from, like, players or, like, a midfielder. What type of drill should I be doing? And keeping it simple in individual training is very important, no matter the position you're in. So even if you're, like, a center back or midfielder, like, one touch passing to the wall, two touch passing, then you touch pass, you turn, and you finish. Uh, things like that, just keeping it simple is a very underrated aspect of it, especially in the younger ages. So I think that's something that we should all keep in mind. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm obviously exactly the same way as you. I go in with like an overarching kind of theme for the session and then I'll do a warm up, which is probably like some dynamic stretching or something, some like ball movement, some juggling. Um, and then it's really whatever fits in the theme that I wanted to do that day. Uh, first touch, uh, passing, whatever it may be. Um, and I like it because like you kind of, I don't know if you really touched on this, but to me, it feels like it's sort of like training with RPE instead of training with sets, you know, because when you start your individual session, if you don't have something planned, you can go like with how you feel. If you're feeling amazing, you can get really intense with it. If you're not, you can just take a little more chill for that day and get a session in under your belt, you know? Yeah, and like, another, like, yeah, no, no, go ahead. In another session, we're going to have to explain what RPE means, rate yeah, of perceived that, exertion, yeah. bringing out those exercise science terms. Yeah. <laughs> have to so seem we, smart while I the, can, you know? The, <laughs> Before too many episodes, when they realize, Dimitri, you're a complete When we do idiot. resistance training, that's going to be the best time to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's where it's the most easily applicable. Okay, yeah, but really, like on, on, no, no, on that ahead. topic about organizing training sessions um my personal opinion is the more advanced you get probably the less organized you actually get in individual sessions because i mean i'll have like an overall arching theme of what i'm gonna do but i've scratched it completely and done some completely opposite once i got to the field because it just doesn't feel right or i want to do this um i i mean i think like as a when you're coaching you should basically put players through almost completely organized, completely structured because that's coaching. You're normally with a team and the team has to do the same thing. You have to teach them yeah. to play as a team. So even if one player is not feeling it that day, well, they got to suck it up and try to play for the team. But when I'm out there by myself, if something's not, if, if I came out to do finishing and I'm just like not feeling my finishing that day, I'll switch to juggling or dribbling or try something else rarely fitness anymore <laughs> you're too you're too fit already um of course. yeah yeah i, I mean That's uh, it's just like 
it's going to depend for, for different players. For some players, like if you don't have a structured session, you might not get on the field, in which case have a structured session and get through that session because that's what works for you. Um, but, you know, uh, like, I, I think this, this depends a lot, um, you know, and if, if you enjoy having a structured session, that means you'll do it more consistently. You'll enjoy it more. You'll get back on the field more, in which case you should have a more structured session. And Absolutely. if if you don't, if you enjoy going to the field uh, and saying, today I'm going to work on passing. Ooh. Oh. Um, <laughs> it, said, it said this. Uh, we well, have unlimited uh, minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. It, this uh, is the big leagues now. <laughs> if... Uh, you know, if, if you enjoy having unstructured sessions, that's going to get you on the field more. Um, so, you know, if, yeah, it's just, it's just about it's personalized. What, yeah. What works, what works best for you um, is, is the best thing to do. And this is a problem I see a lot of players run into where, you know, you're going to, you want to do Cristiano Ronaldo's individual training session. And it's like, you know, if you're not going to enjoy that, don't do it. If you're going to, you know, yeah, it's just it it depends on you and you need to try a lot of different things to kind of figure out what works for you. Um, but, you know, the the most important thing is just getting out on the field and trying those things out and seeing what actually does work for you. All about fun, like we said before, all fun. Yeah, yeah. Fun is by far the most important variable. And I think that really, really, really is the variable that most people overlook. And the people who stay in it to win their, especially past their competitive soccer days and play all their life are going to be the ones that enjoy doing it. The people that quit after high school or college or whatever, the highest level they played are the ones that, well, it was a chore to get out on the pitch and train. Yeah. And I'd rather be the guy, I would rather actually be a worse soccer player and enjoy being out there than be a guy who is actually even good if I just don't want to be out there because if i didn't want to be out there why am i play yeah yeah definitely i like in my experience it's always the ones who um you know you play when i played at the at the youth level um the the players who were around me that were like um firmes, <laughs> like a little bit um you know they did it for you know they uh, they were playing in, a, in an academy. So it was like a little bit of status um, and they would like go what? out and like, yeah, um, like, like wear their, um, you know, their coat that they would wear to games, <laughs> and like, you know, play it up a little bit. Um, and uh, like those kinds of players, they're not playing anymore. Um, if you're not playing first and, and I'm not saying there's anything, you know, wrong with being proud of where you play. Although I think, um, you know, <laughs> playing for for an academy um you know most academy players don't make it so you know chill a little bit on that uh but there's no there's nothing wrong with being proud of being a being a soccer player being a footballer um but the if you're not doing it for the love of the game first i don't think you're going to make it far because it is just so hard and this is a topic we'll you know we'll talk about at another point just how hard it is to succeed in this sport but there are millions and millions of people who want to be professional players um and out of those the the ones that make it will almost always be the ones who love the game because they're willing to put up with a ton of crap um you know to to get to play um they're you know willing to you know spend a year trying to recover from a surgery um, or, you know, go live alone, um, in a, in a country where they don't know anyone, maybe don't speak the language. Um, you're not going to do that if you don't love the sport. Um, because, you know, and most footballers aren't making millions anyway. So, you know, j just, uh, relax a little bit, uh, find your love of the game and, you know, and go from there. Don't, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That 1% that make it pro only 0.001% actually make a good living off of it. Yeah. Most of us make Wild. enough to buy post game meals. Beer Maybe. money. Yeah. <laughs> a post game money. At McDonald's off the dollar menu. <laughs> oh boy, that brings back memories. <laughs> I actually wanted your opinion on a couple of things there. So I I totally agree that it's important to have passion for the game, but where does that tie in with doing it for the money and fame? Because everyone wants that, right? 
So how does that compare to having passion, but also wanting to do it for the money and the fame? For me, I just want to say for me, it's totally passion. Like even if I don't make it pro, I'll still play at the highest level I can on, until I'm like six years old and retired. So where does it tie in with wanting money and fame, but also having that passion? I mean, there's yeah. nothing, there's nothing wrong with, I mean, you know, you need money uh, somehow if, you know, um, and there's nothing wrong with, if you're a good player, expecting to make a little bit of money off, uh, off playing because, you know, you've put a lot of time into this. If there's a team willing to pay you uh, to play, then, uh, you know, that's a great thing. That's awesome. Uh, that's something to be proud of. Um, and it's also, you know, even if you're just playing at like the high school or college level, uh, you know, I've been on teams where it's um, you're cool because you play not so much in the States, but um, <laughs> uh, you know, in, in other places, you know, like you have, you have fans that, that, uh, that comes, come to games. Um, you, you know, meet people out uh, when you're, you know, if you're, if you're playing, um, you know, I was, uh, when I was, when I was living in England, um, you know, I was, you know, in some newspaper articles and stuff and it's, it's cool. Uh, it's fun. You know, I have, I have those, uh, I have my old, my scrapbooks, uh, that my, uh, um, you know, that my mom made me, um, for all of my, you know, uh, achievements when I was playing and it's cool. It's, it's fun. Um, so I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I just think you need to always, um, that like the passion needs to come first so that you're making decisions, um, based, based on your love of the game, not based, um, on the the money and the and the fame yeah, that's that stuff can come into it but it's obviously it's not uh it just shouldn't be the the main the main focus the main it, yeah i mean yeah. yeah i don't think there's anything wrong with it i mean i think probably some professionals in the highest level definitely just do it because they are good at it so they make a lot of money so they're very famous you know and that's fine I feel like you're going to have a lot less fun doing that. You know, you're not going to enjoy it as much as if you don't actually like playing soccer. Um, but yeah, I think there might've even been like some article about David V or something where he was like, yeah, I sort of prefer basketball to soccer, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but look at how good he is. Um, well, how, t- so how tall was, I don't, I don't think he had a hope to play basketball. <laughs> he was pretty short, right? He must. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I think, I think he's right under five ten. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, on this point, I would say the players that succeed at the highest levels are one, the genetically gifted athletes like Cristiano Ronaldo and the ones that enjoy the game who would be out there playing for fun, even if there was no money involved. Sure. I can't really see a world where Cristiano Ronaldo, if professional soccer didn't exist, isn't in Portugal playing after work every single day because he's Cristiano Ronaldo wanting yeah. to be yeah. the best player in his local town. And Obviously, it's a good thing for athletes that professional sports exist or even college scholarships for that matter for athletes in America. And I think like for you as a player, the most important thing is passion. But we do actually need to keep in mind like we want to expand this to allow more people opportunity to play professional. The professional players that already have it, let's get them better pay. Let's get them benefits. Let's Let's make it to where more people can actually potentially do this as a living. It really becomes more of a labor issue, in my opinion, than it is Mm -hmm. soccer. And trying to figure out a way to make it to where more people can do what they love for a living, or at least pocket change. I mean, if we could take the like top state Sunday leagues and make them semi-pro, that would be like a dream come true. (laughs) Yeah, it'd be be awesome. Because, you know, it does help even uh you know making a little bit of money off playing just uh you know it can it can help a lot because a lot of people you know give up because it's just you put a lot of time in if you're not getting anything out once you're you know thinking about getting getting married having kids uh you know it's tough to justify anymore uh and you know on that i you know obviously um i have a huge passion for for coaching as well Um, which is something I know everyone here has, you know, at least some experience in, um, and, um, you know, playing is, 
is, is great. Um, but then also, you know, thinking about what you're going to do afterwards. And if you, if you love the game, you know, stay involved in it, um, do some coaching or, you know, work in sport in, uh, in any capacity. Um, I think, you know, that's helpful too, because a lot of, you know, professional players, you touched on it before, uh, they're not making enough money to live off or definitely not enough money to live off for, you know, ever not enough money to retire off. Um, so if you love the game, uh, after you've played, you know, you could, you probably have some opportunities, um, to, you know, stay involved and, and make money that way. Um, obviously I've made more money, uh, coaching than I ever made, uh, playing, <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's all, uh, you know, I, I'm still involved in the sport and starting to play again as well, which is, uh, you know, great. And I wouldn't be doing that if I didn't, if I didn't absolutely love the sport. Um, so just really, I want to touch really quick on, um, I know we talked about it a little bit, um, but um, Dimitri brought up how he doesn't like to like structure things by sets. And I agree with that. I see a lot of sessions where it's like, you know, um, you need to do a hundred wall passes or like a hundred, like, 10 shots in this drill that you're doing. I really, really prefer, and this is something that I picked up um, when I was trying to, uh, you know, get my fitness back up. Um, someone told me to run timed runs instead of run a set distance. Um, and it helped me so much. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was crazy. And obviously, you know, shouldn't be running just long distances um, at a steady pace. Um you know, but I would like run around the block and do intervals. But when I switched that to doing like, uh, 20 or 30 minutes of, of those intervals, it just helped me so much with motivation. And that's how I structure all of my technical sessions. I don't do by sets. I do, you know, five minutes of this, 10 minutes of this, 15 minutes of this, 20 minutes of this. Um, and I just think, I think that's just so much better. It helped. It's helped me so much. With technical sessions in particular, I would say that the correct number of sets is how many you need. Um, for example, if it's something that I'm good at, I might do once or twice just for fun. And then I'm moving on. I'm not doing a set of 10 just if I've already mastered it. Yeah. But if it's something I'm struggling with, I mean, let's say my weak-footed free kicks aren't going in today. I might do 100. <laughs> They're horrible. They're atrocious right now. Hate them. Right, speak for yourself. You Mine are pretty good. <laughs> 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 uh, but I actually, that's, that's another thing I wanted to bring up is with Individual trainings, this is obviously the next most overlooked thing behind fun. Use your weak foot. Um, do weak-footed stuff at least double what your strong foot is, in my opinion. Um, when I do finishing today, I actually probably take about five shots for every one shot with my strong foot. I take five with my weak foot. And I've actually just like all my finishing, whether it's finishing just shooting, just free kicks doing a dribbling move to create space, turning, I'm still doing more to my right foot than my left foot because in a game situation, I do a lot of my left-footed stuff instinctively and I don't need to train that as much, don't need to train it as consistently. With my right foot, I actually have to think about it still sometimes. So training that more often makes it more likely for in a game situation that I'm going to hit the move and go to my right foot when it's open. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. Um, yeah. And like, you know, if you say, oh, I'm going to do 10 minutes of wall passing and you're getting really into the wall passing um, and you just want to do it for longer or you're struggling with it um, and you don't want to move on, you're very like, obviously, sometimes if I'm frustrated with something, I will move on and come back to it another day. Uh, but sometimes if I'm frustrated, but I'm also motivated. So I'm, you know, doing whatever I'm doing, working on a freestyle move, um, <laughs> or something and I can't get it, but I'm like, oh, I'm so close. I'm, I'm going to spend another 10 minutes on this and nail it. Um, you know, it, like, like we said about, you know, having things structured out, um, even if you do have things very structured out and even if you like that, be willing to change that up as you go. No session is going to go perfectly. No session is going to go exactly as you plan it out. Even if you plan it out, um, and trying to force it to stick to that structure, I think is a mistake. Um, you know, you, you need to adapt as things go. Good, good lesson just for, for life and for soccer in general, because nothing ever goes as you expect. Life and lesson you just gotta, number yeah, two, baby. Yeah, you just have to, uh, you just have to figure it out as you go. I think, I think it's, uh, you know, super helpful to kind of have that mindset. 
Boy and Pingree. Yeah. Uh, or you guys can go. It's fine. Go ahead, SK. All right. So one thing that I was thinking about, and I think one of you made a post on it on TikTok. I'm not sure who it was, which is <laughs> not to work so much on your weaknesses, but to work more on your strengths. Right. And I think that <laughs> yeah, that's a great point, you know. I do think like having a good weak foot, having basic dribbling skills, even if you're like a goalkeeper is important. But a lot of the times I see like some players working on some some weaknesses that they're never going to use in games. And that time could be used to work on the strengths that they're pretty good at. But if they can get to that next level, it's going to be a lot more beneficial for them. Yeah, Dimitri is going to go quickly post his first TikTok video and just Ooh, say, yeah. just him saying, work on your strengths, not your weaknesses, just so you can claim yeah. credit for that. No, <laughs> well, I think actually, wait, uh, going off of that, when I was in England, I remember uh, one of the coaches told to me at a certain point, just try to hide your weaknesses. You know, if you're not very <laughs> good at offensive headers, just like do your best, but don't like highlight that as a weakness for yourself, you know, focus on the things you're good at. If you're good at like making plays in the final third, like keep practicing, practicing that, improve that, make it even deadlier. Um, because at some point you're going to have strengths and weaknesses to a point, you know, you're going to have things you're better at things you're worse at. Um, so might as well focus on the positives and just take them all the way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think uh, just really quick. I think like I had this, uh, this written down actually is like, there are certain things you need. You cannot hide. If you can't take a good first touch, you're not a good player. I'm sorry. Like if you can't take a good first touch, you can't do anything ever. Like how, how are you ever, how are you ever going to do anything? Yeah. Um, if you can't pass what, yeah. like, you, <laughs> like most, most of the time when Neymar gets the ball, you know what he does at the end of his play? He passes. Like the most players, every time they get the ball, they pass. Sometimes they dribble first. Sometimes they win the ball first, but they usually pass at the end of it. So if you can't take Everybody a first pass. touch, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you can't take a first touch and if you can't pass, you, know, you need to sort those things out. I also think weak foot is in there. I think um, you you can't like there are good players who don't have a very strong weak foot, uh, but it's still probably better than you listening to this podcast right now. Um, I think those, so those, those three things, first touch passing and, you know, doing, being able to do that with both feet um, are incredibly, incredibly important. Um, I don't think you can hide those things after that though. If you're not good in one V one situations, don't take them, you know, uh, you don't, you know, some of the, some of the best players in the world, you know, if you're playing center mid, um, you don't ever need to try to dribble past someone. You can just, yeah. you know, make smart passes yeah. and, you know, work around that. And then again, if you're not good at shooting, you, you know, uh, I think shooting is an overrated skill anyway, because most goals are scored from inside the box. And from there, yeah. you just need to pass it in. But yeah, like there are certain things you can't hide, but after that, I think building on your strength is super, super helpful. Also yeah, more and, enjoyable. And yeah. just, just building on, I mean, basically exactly what Cristo said is unless it's a glaring weakness that obviously makes you an ineffective player in the game, such as the things you said, most of the good players do a few things very, very well. Some things okay, and then they just don't do their weaknesses. And this is actually true even to up to the highest at high levels. I mean, yeah, sure. There are some players that have almost no weaknesses, but those are few and far between. Those are the very special elite players. But but most players, they're either a very good passer, a very good <laughs> dribbler, uh, or they're a very good defender. And when they, on offense, they're good enough at passing and keeping possession that they're not going to make too many mistakes but they know their role. Their role is to stop the attack, try to win the ball back, and then when they win the ball back, retain possession and not just cop it back up again. And now the one exception to this is goalkeepers with bad foot skills. If you're a goalkeeper with bad foot skills, you should be doing field training sessions, legit field training sessions, and play 
as a field player in training sessions, so you get forced to be good at, with your foot skills. And also, what's up with goalkeepers not scoring goals? Serious problem. They're really lacking in that department. They, oh, they own goals, improve. own goals included. <laughs> <laughs> no, they do that enough already. <laughs> we need we need more Hogerio Senes who score from free kicks. I yeah, mean, true. Well, goalkeepers should be. I had a. When I was at the academy in, uh, yeah, in Greece, actually, we had a goalkeeper coach and oh my God, I've never seen someone strike the ball like he did. Like he was, he did sessions with all the goalkeepers. So you get the goalkeepers, you know, first team, uh, the reserve team, uh, under 18 team, it would get them all together, you know, six goalkeepers, seven, eight goalkeepers. Um, and he would have them for an hour and he'd just be ripping shots at them the whole time. Um, and oh my God, this guy, like, you know, he put the ball a- exactly where he wanted every single time, left, left foot, right foot. Uh, this guy was a terror. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, it's, it's insane. And um, I think this is good. Um, so unless someone wants to add anything else, we can move on to kind of going through um, each position. Obviously, there are going to be a lot of you know similarities uh, between these positions, but it's something that I'm asked all the time. So we might as well touch on it a little bit, um, starting with goalkeepers. Uh, anyone have anyth- anything to add before we kind of hop into this? Um, are, we else? I do. Go ahead. are we on positions? Yeah, yeah. Um. Okay, so for goalkeeper, does anyone else here have experience playing goalkeeper other than me? Dimitri. At a very at a youth <laughs> level. So, Dimitri, so and, then I, meet, and then I broke his finger, and then he never played. So, yeah. So, yeah. so when we meet up, I'm just going to take shots on all three of you instead. <laughs> but but okay, you're, so for, you're goalkeeper for the TikTok team, because I actually, I don't think we have an American TikToker who's a goalkeeper. I can't think of one. Shine. <laughs> yeah, but I'm also this. I'm also the striker, the center forward, and a defender. <laughs> yeah, but I thought um, times you, you can't you can't steal the goals from me. I if I don't score the most goals, I I'm quitting. I'm sorry. Uh, it's just how it goes. And I come up for free kicks, and you're standing there to get a tap in after. <laughs> I, hey, uh, I thrive on tap ins. So so individual only way I score. <laughs> as a goalkeeper is probably the biggest nightmare I can think of. Cause what can you train? And the biggest thing I'd say is your foot skills actually. And train like you're a freaking field player yeah. or practice goal kicks. Like even though long goal kicks seem to be becoming a less common feature of the game, they're still necessary and you still need to be able to play a long ball out with both feet as a goalkeeper. I recently watching the Nashville soccer club games and for the MLS, our goalkeeper is amazing at every goalkeeping aspect, except his foot skills and mm-hmm. his weak foot is atrocious. So if we play a bass packs, his weak foot, I'm holding my breath the entire time, but everything else is amazing. But so with individual training sessions, try to find, try to work on your foot skills and try to find a friend. Yeah. Friend who likes shooting. Every field player on your team normally loves shooting. Doesn't yeah. matter which position they play. They all want to be the center forward. They're just normally not good enough. But find a friend that wants to take shots on you and will take shots. But also try to do certain things where you practice grabbing crosses. Because in my opinion, grabbing crosses is a lot harder than shots yeah. anyways. Because it's harder to judge. You have defenders trying. I mean, not defenders, but attackers trying to get in your way. Sometimes to defenders. Get the ball. <laughs> You yeah, probably have often. some defenders in the way. Yeah, yeah, probably do, and <laughs> just run through them. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think, um, you know, um, obviously, you need to be facing a lot of shots most, you know, every week if you're a goalkeeper. Um, but hopefully, you do this in your team training. Um, and if you don't. Obviously, you know, find you, it shouldn't be too hard to find a partner because everyone loves shooting um, to do that with. Um, so that's that's great. So basically what we said at the start, find a partner if you can find a gr- small group if you can. But don't think that you're wasting your time if you're not facing shots. Most goalkeepers don't t- train distribution at all. Um, throws, kicks, punts. You need to be do it like great goalkeepers do this stuff and 
like re- truly great goalkeepers. You know, they're uh, putting goalkeepers, uh, goal kicks right on, you know, players' feet who are standing at half field. If you can't do that, you can't improve your goal kicks. You can improve your punts and your throws. Um, get a bag of balls and go out to a field and do this stuff. Or if you only have one ball, do it into a net. Just like, you know, stand there and take goal kicks into a net. You know if the contact is good. Uh, you don't need to see the ball go, you know, to half field to know that it's a good strike or a good punt or whatever. Um, so do this stuff. And then first touch in passing in the modern game, you need to be able to play out from the back. It always sucks when a team has a goalkeeper that they're afraid to pass the ball back to. And I remember, you know, as a player, it's such a relief when when you can you play the ball back to your goalkeeper um, and they can take a touch and pass it out or clear it if they need to. It's just, you know, it's a completely different feeling. Um, and, you know, that's just a uh, super important. Don't think that you only use your hands as a goalkeeper. Yeah, you're still a soccer player. True. I meant to say when I was playing at the at the youth level because I had a um yeah a great great goalkeeper uh and then we also had a, a crap goalkeeper and they were on the same team and one could use their feet one was as good a field player as any of us um and the other one was uh yeah shouldn't have been there um, so it was an interesting experience because it was like first half we were fine second half we were we never passed the ball back <laughs> nice uh i'm sorry to interrupt but i think i have to go in like 15 to 20 minutes so just a heads up yeah yeah that uh i think i think we'll yeah we'll go through this um okay. pretty quick uh we'll go through the positions and then we'll um yeah uh so we can move on to and as i said i know this is going to be very similar position to position but we might as well go through it because people ask um, so full backs first touch and passing and get yeah. yourself fit. I oh, don't yeah. know what else yeah. to say. Fitness. Whip in, whip in some uh, crosses and fitness. Like, you know, I know we, we talked about this fitness usually with a ball and make it enjoyable so that you don't know it's fitness. Like you can do, um, stuff that works on your first touch. Uh, as long as you're do, doing it with intensity, that's your fitness work. Yeah. Um, you know, but just like making sure that you are fit through your individual training is very, very important for a fullback. One other thing I can add in technical aspect more on the dribbling side, I think can be very important going back to strength and weaknesses, depending on what kind of player you are. If you, if your coach wants to overlap more or stay back and act more of a defender, but I would say dribbling aspect is very important as well for fullback. Yeah. And yeah. like running with the ball when you have space, like I think I don't see players train this at all because they're like, ah, that's easy. But you yeah. know, there's a, there's a different, like if you have a lot of space, some players and, and like no, no defender in front of you, some players can cover that space very, very quickly. And some can't. And if you can't like train that run with the ball, like yeah. with, you know, nice big yeah. touches um, because you will get space uh, if you're playing out wide um to run with the ball and you know you should be you should be training that and just to build on to that with the dribbling aspect i mean especially with the modern game but also slightly less modern for me like the ideal back would be roberto carlos or Cafu, players like that and more modern you think of Dani alves or someone like that and these guys are just as dangerous going forward as they are at good defenders and that's something that I think, yeah, they're actually arguably they're <laughs> much better at attacking than even defense. But that's something I think that's missing about a lot of people that put them back at the amateur levels and especially the youth levels is they think, well, I'm a defender. I remember one of my youth teams I coached, I played them in a 5-3-2 and I put two of my best dribblers as the wingbacks. And they complain, the they complain so much. And I'm like, dude, you get to be Roberto Carlos. Yeah. Why are you complaining? <laughs> Roberto Carlos is a beast. And I want you bombing up the flanks, going all the way back, all the way forward. I know you have the fitness to do it. But because I called them a wing back, they were like, they didn't like it. They wanted to be a wing forward <laughs> or something else. But yeah, getting really good at dribbling is... Very important. And also that would carry on if you were playing further up the pitch. 
Yeah, definitely. as a winger. Yeah, and I mean, you know, and there's, you know, uh, something I talk about all the time is, you know, you probably switch positions um, as you as you move up, as you you know get older. Um, I'm sure everyone here has experienced doing that, playing in, in multiple positions, either at the same time or over the course of their career. Um, so you need to be good at everything. Um, you know, you there's you never know what a coach is going to, you know, when a coach is going to look at you and be like, he's telling me he plays a full as fullback, but I don't, I don't think he's actually going to be a fullback for me. Um, so yeah. So I guess we covered fullback. We can move on to, uh, to center back, probably dribbling might, might not be the most important thing. Um, but again, you know, it's going to be first touch and passing for me. And then if, uh, and you know, weak foot, um, and then if you can find a, find a partner and, you know, do some, this goes for fullback to, you know, one V one defending probably more so for a fullback, but then if you can train for a center back, you know, uh, clearing the ball off crosses or, you know, winning the ball in the air, that stuff can be beneficial. Obviously you probably need a partner for that. Uh, but you know, that, that stuff can help. One thing I want, I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but good distribution, I think is a must for center backs, either if that's like short passing, finding the option or just doing things. Long passing. Long yeah. passing. Yeah. Yeah. With both feet too. Yeah. Both and feet. headers, headers are really important. This actually brings in, this is an area where some of the more fitness specific stuff might become in hand because if there is one position on the pitch where a vertical jump really, 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 really matters, it might be the center back because they're reliant so much on being able to jump up and get ahead of the attackers to clear the ball and headers. So this is where you might, at the beginning of a training session, do some plyometrics for jumping and stuff like that while you're still fresh. And it's important to do this at the beginning of the training session so you're fresh because you want to be explosive. And you can do that. You can even do some of that with the ball, even if you're by yourself, like juggle the ball up in the air and just take a step and head it. Yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, getting, uh, you know, if you, if you take headers in training, you'll be, um, you know, more ready, more ready to do that in, in team training sessions and then in, and then in games. So, you know, definitely, definitely helpful, you know, to find a way to get it done. Even if you, um, even if it's not ideal, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta make it work with what you have. Yeah. Um, and then we can move on. We'll just do, you know, center mid wingers and, uh, and uh, attackers. So <laughs> I sound like a broken record, but center mid first touch and passing. Um, and, yeah. you know, if you can find a group and do like some possession stuff, that's great. Um, and because I think the, the biggest thing for center mids for me is, you know, making quick decisions because you hardly have any time on the ball. Um, so uh, even though it's tough, um, either you need to find a good you know, good players to play with, or just when you're doing your stuff, when you're doing your wall passing, uh, can you, can you pass against two walls? So, you know, in a, in a corner so that you can receive and then pass in another direction and then, you know, repeat that. Um, that's something that's great. Or if you have a wall on each side, you know, you can receive and pass, um, like that and add in a little bit of decision-making if you can, um, even if you're not training with someone, maybe you can have someone, you know, shouting like where to pass or like moving so that, you know, um, where to pass just to add in a little bit of decision-making because that is just so, so important yeah. uh, if you're playing in the middle of the field. One thing I want to add is speed of play. Like you, like you said, is so, so important and having those extra, like two, three friends to help you practice can make all the difference between a good and a bad center midfield. And for center midfielders, like as much as you individually train, it's not as good to get the experience to improve your speed of play. Like I don't think you can improve your speed of play hugely by just doing individual training. So team trainings, training with the group is very, very important for center midfielders. Yeah, that's what I'd say. Like for a center mid, it's probably like uh, if I was going to say like one position would benefit the most from doing more sessions with other people, probably center mid. Um, yeah, but uh, obviously, you know, I think everyone benefits from that, but it's just like, you know, in the middle of the field, you need to play simply, you need to play quick, you need to make good decisions. Yeah. How do you learn that? You learn that playing with other players. So what I would like to add, and I think central midfield is probably the most important position for this. The 
thing that separates a good central midfielder from a mediocre one is my ability is the ability to turn ability to receive the ball from your back and then turn and go forward or receive it from the left wing and turn and go to the right wing. So practice a lot of dribbling things to where you're receiving the ball, turning quickly, and then you either dribble or distribute the ball to your teammates and stuff like that. And that's really, I mean, if I was going to look, was coaching a team and was looking for who do I want to play as center mid, it's the players who can do that the best. Yeah. It's the players who can quickly turn, maybe even turn with a man on their back and keep possession, but also be dangerous with it. Also yeah. pose a threat. Yeah, there's a huge difference between a center mid who only plays sideways and backwards and a center <laughs> mid who can play forward. And that's the those are the players that I hate hate the most more than anything. I'd ra- I'd take a forward who never scores over a center mid who only plays the ball backwards and sideways uh, any day of the week. Yep. Um, so then we can move on to, and obviously center mid could be defensive, uh, the you know box to box attacking. The individual training probably isn't going to change too too much. Um, for winger, the the one thing I'll say for winger, I think. It, um, if you were going to find a partner to train with, maybe apart from goalkeeper, finding that for a winger is the probably the most helpful because you're probably on the wing because your coach thinks that you're uh, you know good when you're isolated in those one v one situations. That's where you have them out on the wing. Not saying it doesn't ha- happen other to other positions, other places on the field, uh, but if you're a winger, you need to get confident in one v ones. So you need to take a lot of one v ones. Find someone. Uh, who you can train one v ones with, and you know, go to town. Uh, you can do a, you know full sessions just on one v ones for sure. Easily. Uh, one thing I would like to add is, as a winger, being able to cut in on your weak side and shoot and finish, I think is very important because at the higher levels, if you if you have a winger that's playing playing on the left side and he's just left footed. Then all you have to do as a fullback is just jockey him to the sideline, and then you you block him off because you know he can't cut in on his right foot. So I think finishing with both feet as a winger is important, in my opinion. And and crossing right, like and crossing, way, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, being able to go good. both both ways, right? Like you yeah. just don't want to be restricted to either crossing or finishing. You want to be able to do both with both feet. Being able to play on both wings super helpful for a coach yeah, uh, as well. You know. And that's something I think we'll probably have to add on to this later, but like in the modern game in particular, normally they do it the opposite way around. Your right-footed player plays on the left wing and your left-footed player plays on the right wing. And it's for that reason particularly because they want them to be dangerous coming in. And really what makes a good winger for me is that they provide that danger going inside. Because I I remember watching some college soccer games um, that my friends were playing in and the wingers they basically ran to the corner flag and crossed every single time. And it was, and I was just like, these are D one soccer teams. And it's like, they still do the most rudimentary and easily defended tactic every single time and watched one game where the winger was a little bit better. And all they did was cut inside to their (laughs) left foot and they were just dicing the other team. And the other team didn't know how to defend it because that every other game they play, the winger just runs to the corner flag. And that's the big thing is, and to be fair, some of this also lies on coaches. Um, in my youth career, I played a whole, whole lot of left wing. Wonder why? Because I was the left, only left footed yeah. player on the team. <laughs> so obviously that's the only position I was capable of playing. Right. But I'm surprised coaches, they didn't put you left back. I was too good at scoring, <laughs> but, 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 but the thing is, is they, they have to wingers are probably one of the positions where being two footed is a necessity. And you, cause you need to be able to cross with both feet. You need to be able to shoot with both feet, depending on the situation. And also if you have a teammate practice things like give and goes little give and goes are, should be your bread and butter. That's where you make your living. actually. Yeah. Um, and obviously you need to be able to take a first touch and you need to be able to pass the ball. <laughs> Um, yeah. and then, uh, we can go to, uh, center forward, which will be more of the same for such and passing. Um, but what I will say is, um, I see a lot of players who think they're attacking players and they're like, okay, I'm going to go spend an hour shooting the ball from outside the box. 90% of goals are scored inside the box, not more than that. It's like 95%. And then like 
Of that, 80% of goals are scored from the penalty box or from the, the penalty, um, penalty spot and forward uh, within the box. So from there, do you need to be able to smash the ball? No. Most goals, if you're a striker, most goals are going to come from passing the ball into the net. Um, oh, so, yeah, or yeah, or that, <laughs> or just like bundle, bundling it across the line somehow. But like, you know, if you're going to do shooting things, um, I love uh, finishing off sessions with this. Do you know this? But, um, you know, have, having, if you have some partners to have, you could do this alone as well, uh, by just like popping the ball up, take a first touchdown, like on the penalty spot and finish from there. Um, but I like putting players like, you know, diagonally in front of you. So you're standing here at the penalty spot. There's a player at the side of the goal here, side of the goal here, playing balls on the floor or in the air to you. And you're either, you know, finishing first time or yeah. taking a touch and then finishing. Uh, that's one of my, one of my favorite things to do. I am, a, I am a forward. Um, but yeah, I mean, most of those are going to be passes into the net. Most of them are not going to be, you know, shots ripped as hard as you can. And something that I think this is really important because I'm a striker as well normally. Um, a very large percentage of your touches as a striker are probably going to be back to goal. And this is what a lot of young players don't understand. Young players always want the through ball. They always want the through ball to where they're 1v1 with the keeper. And it's like, no, that's not how you're going to get the majority of your touches. Majority of your touches, you're probably going to be back to goal and there's going to be a guy on your back. And this is why turning and finishing is probably should be one of your bread and butter moves to practice. And one of the things I, I really love to do when I'm training by myself is I basically just juggle the ball up into the air, either take a touch and turn or, or turn literally on my first touch and finish and there's many different ways i've managed to create some sort of more challenge to it without a defender and sometimes that's incorporating the freestyle tricks into my finishing shrill so i'll do a trick especially like one of the spinning tricks receive it on the first touch and turn and finish and this will actually simulate being able to do something very very quick and to where the defender can't react. Like if I can take that touch quick enough, I can get it behind the defender and shoot before they can even react. Yeah. No, that, yeah, that's, that's definitely a good point. I think that's, yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, and then um, just to, uh, so we've covered all the positions, so you know what to do now, whatever position you play. Um, I just want to finish uh, really quick with this because I don't first think we touch touched and on passing. It. Yeah, first touch and passing, weak foot. That's all you need. Um, <laughs> that's the whole podcast. That's all we needed to say. Um, <laughs> yeah, for every position. I mean, you're a soccer player at one point or another. I mean, yeah. I should be comfortable at center back or center forward, and I hope some more people start being comfortable at goalkeeper. <laughs> Suck it yeah. up, Christo. Get a goal. <laughs> yeah, I'll do. I'll do some training. Um, uh, the last thing I'll say is you should be doing some technical training most days. Like I don't care how many days a week you're team training, even if you're doing like four or five times a week of team training, if you want to be the best player that you can be, um, and this could be 15 minutes of training, uh, but you should be doing it most days, I think, because the consistency is the most important thing. So, you know, if you're not doing um, some technical work on your own or with a small group, um, you know, playing pickup or something like that, like three or four times a week, at least, um, you should probably get to where you're doing that. Yeah. Agreed. Even if it's juggling while you're sitting on the couch, watching TV, which yep. I used to do all the time. Uh, yeah. Well, I have, uh, I, at our finish. house, we just have balls all around. <laughs> We just have Can balls you, all around the house. So you walk into the kitchen, you're just <laughs> dribbling, you know, you just Kiwi, walk into the, yeah. like the bathroom. There's a ball on the floor. Kiwi has a little uh, soccer ball. My cat um, that he uh, it's like a little foam one. It's like uh, like that big um, and he kicks it around. So it's always in a different room. Uh, and then when I find it, I kick it around with him. <laughs> oh, funny. yeah. I play soccer <laughs> with my cats as well. My cats are all soccer players. <laughs> we'll get them. Uh, we'll get them. Uh, we'll have a. <laughs> A team, a uh, TikTok team, and then we'll have a, a team of TikTok cats. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I uh, prefer that one, honestly. By far. Well, this is, this no, is as soon as, as soon as we start filming our cats playing soccer, it's like a million subscribers overnight, yeah. and 
all of a sudden my cat is famous and no one knows who I am, but yeah, I guess we could probably monetize can, it at that point. It, yeah, <laughs> why not? Why the channel has to be like Jason Noblet's cat. You know, that has to be the name of the channel. Just so oh, I don't, no, know. The, don't no, give no, this cat no, a name. No, no, no. no more names. Well, no, my cat's name's perfect because it's Zizu. After oh, Zizu. oh, nice. And the other one is Falcom and Totti. Oh, nice. So we got like a literal legends team already. <laughs> All right, I'll have to uh, I'll have to carry that theme when we when we get uh, when we get more cats. Just code in Kiwi for now, or change their names. I wonder. I'm a crazy cat that. soccer <laughs> coach and have a full eleven. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, the water bottle is empty, uh, and it was full when we started. So I guess that means that we're wrapping up the podcast. Uh, SKs as well. Dimitri, you still have any water in there? No, nah, it's empty. It was empty oh, since I'm, like oh. it was full to start with, but all the. <laughs> All the shenanigans at the beginning had it already. I wasn't aware we were supposed to have a water bottle, so I took a protein (laughs) shake before I came here. (laughs) Hydration, that's the number one, the number one tip. Yeah, if you're not uh, hydrating for your individual individual training, what are you doing? Hydration, first touch, and passing. (laughs) I do have my beer fridge with me though. All right. (laughs) Good enough. Yeah, we'll Uh, see. Well, um, this has been great. Um I guess we will wrap up the first ever episode of the uh, Improving Always podcast. Um, and yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for watching. Uh, we'll be back again with some more topics. We'll we'll touch on uh, this. You know, I have a list and it's uh, growing every day, so we have plenty of stuff to talk about. Um, yeah, uh, peace. Peace. <laughs>